but I do believe the illusion is that we are making it up. You know, we are the creators of our experience. And so you and I are talking. And as you said, we have all very different experiences and we are literally not even physically there. So you may actually be some AI who is just, you know, talking there and and that's totally fine. I have a good connection with you. So whatever you are, I'm happy with this. But the thing is just we cannot really see anything without our interpretations, without our filters, without that what we are making out of it. And, you know, you can see it right now very clearly in the big divide politically. You know, there is. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Friedman, and I am here on. Shit, I forgot. This <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Your, uh, your superior self. Your superior self. Hey. Um, I am here on Your Superior Self, and I'm really excited to chat. Yes, sir. Dr. Friedman, thank you so much for taking the time. All the way in uh, Germany, is that, is that where you're France. at? France. France. Wow. What time is it there? It is five o'clock. Five o'clock somewhere. Um, just picked up your book not too long ago, The Empowerment Solution. Really love it. Very interesting, right up my alley, talking about the subconscious and programs that we uh, kind of um, are limited by in our lives, right? Um, how did you get into this work, right? Like you started out as an MD and now you're kind of like in the self-empowerment realm. Like how, how what did that look like? Well, I think I felt very disempowered myself. So <laughs> that was definitely a search that I was, I don't know, underway since I was 10 years old or younger. I had a lot of anxiety. So when I grew up, I was a very anxious kid, not right from the start, but when the pressure was on and I had to perform and I had to have good grades and all of a sudden the seriousness of life hit me. And I became a doctor because everyone in my family was a doctor. So it was kind of, you know, uh, expect it. You're going to go into those footsteps. I wanted to become an actor, but that was not anything <laughs> my parents supported. And so I became a doctor. And, uh, you know, after a while, you just feel empty. I felt that two things happened. One is I became more anxious because there was a lot of pressure because I chose to be in a university hospital. You had to do research and you had to do your client work and the pressure was huge. And the second thing is I became more callous. I felt less because, you know, when you are having to see so many people and there's so much life and death and all these things, at some point you kind of shut down because you cannot let it really get to you. And the interesting thing is when you shut down, it doesn't mean you feel happier. You feel actually more dead. And that feeling made me also feel more lost. And that combined with anxiety, got me then to you know, look for something. And thank God, in some ways, uh, there was this uh, mandatory two years in the US uh, for research. And so I went to do research and there was kind of a time where I felt, wow, finally I can take a breather. I can do my research, it's creative. And then I realized, wow, there's so much going on in the cells that's so much more powerful and magical than I ever learned in medical school. And so I got really interested in what is it, what makes our body work? You know, my, my first business was called Cellular Wisdom, which mm -hmm. I just, you know, basically refer to that there is so much wisdom inside of us. Every cell has the ability to heal and, and, you know, grow and adapt. So if we have this in one cell, I thought, okay, we have to have it somewhere else. And and that was for me the the beginning of interested in the subconscious mind and in parallel to that i got really into yoga meditation kundalini yoga mainly and that helped me to get more connected to myself and that all together made me decide let's stop being in the allopathic you know western medicine realm and and do something that really helps us to tap into that wisdom, into that power, rather than just fixing the symptom or chasing the problems. And 
I think it was the anxiety ultimately that got me there because if I had not anxiety, I probably would still, you know, dabble around in being a doctor, a researcher and totally unhappy, but also totally numb. And that was not an option for my anxiety. And that was clear message, do something different, go on a different path. And I'm really grateful for that. And there was no anxiety with that. <laughs> oh, you know, not actually, I have to say not as much. Really? Because the anxiety that I had was what will my parents think? Because, you know, my dad didn't talk for me for with me for a while. He was definitely not happy. You know, it's, it was something that he couldn't even imagine. Why do you quit something that you've been studying so long for? And, you know, mm -hmm. it's such a cushy job now that and but the desire and the excitement of doing something that I really felt like was so much more purposeful and so much more me that was not really anxiety ridden that was actually more like yeah excitement and yeah of course there was a will it work or not that question always came up but i don't i didn't doubt it i was just so sure that this is why i'm here and i guess that's true sure. <laughs> at least that's what i believe now the cellular intelligence right is that associated wisdom. with wisdom yeah. yeah is that associated with epigenetics well, for sure. I mean, you could say that even genetics in itself is very wise because, you know, it's not like, oh, yeah, you have these genes and that's what you have to live with. I mean, they turn off, they get activated, they get deactivated. I mean, there's a lot of stuff happens with the genes, too. It's like a library that gets sometimes open and closed. But epigenetics certainly is also the adaptability. You know, when we are even in the womb or detecting the mother's fear, even in the womb, we are able to feel oh, wow, there is something wrong here. And then the epigenetics activates these self-defense uh, mechanisms and self-defense genes that tells you, wow, there is an awareness that we have, there is a wisdom that we have, and there are also problems that start way early before we can consciously even think. And that's an interesting thing working with the subconscious, you know, where you're, when you're only on the conscious rational level, you don't really access these root causes. But when you go deeper in the subconscious, there are lots of things that come up. Ah, oh, man, there's so many ways I want to go with this, right? Um, <laughs> where do you think the trauma goes, right? Like, uh, from an, a perspective of cellular wisdom, right? Like when you're experiencing the stress from your mother inside the womb, and you're growing up in those adolescent years, and you have this trauma, does it reside in the body? Does it stay in the body? Well, for sure. I mean, a lot of people do have trauma in their body. And, you know, we all know these spontaneous memories, you know, where people have an acupuncture appointment or a massage and whoa, they remember where they were abused as babies or as little children, and they had totally suppressed that memory. And that is certainly something where the trauma is in the body. But, you know, you don't need abuse for emotions to get transferred in the body. See, the way I see it is that when there is trauma, it's usually something that is more like a confusion. You know, whenever trauma happens, it's like, whoa, what happened? I, I didn't see that coming. And then there are questions, you know, how could I have prevented from happening? Or was it my fault? Or why did this happen? And those questions, they are creating anxiety. They are creating the post-traumatic stress. They are creating, you know, this feeling of constantly being on the edge whether you're consciously aware of it or, or not. I mean, this is more subconscious. And if it's not addressed, it does go in the body. It's almost like at some point, you know, this energy that gets created through this confusion has to go somewhere. And since we are not dogs or cats that just shake themselves, we are just, you know, transferring it into the cells and the cells hold it. Just as, you know, many things are held in the cells until finally we get to it. And that's why illness and emotions are so related to each other. Sure. How do you release it, right? Like, is it a cathartic experience where you, you know, you fully go back to that event in your life and feel it fully, or is it some other method that you can kind of uh, utilize to release that trauma or that anxiety? I mean, what I use is a method called the pattern resolution process, where basically you go back to the earliest where the trauma or, you know, the pattern of anxiety or feeling not safe start it but you're not really associating yourself with a trauma because the problem is if you go back into who you were at that time you actually re-traumatize a trauma so a better 
method is more to observe it from the outside and then really get the questions. What is unresolved? What is it still what we need to understand? And and then, you know, the beauty about the subconscious is so creative. I mean, subconscious is your, your inner, you know, artist. And so you can use whatever you want for the subconscious just to understand, oh, wow, we are now pouring healing in there. Oh, we are making this person who abused us smaller, or we're taking him out, and we are creating an alternate reality. Subconscious does not care if it's real or not. The subconscious only cares what we do with the information we have. That's why we can also project into the future. I mean, how many people have trauma that never happened, but they always imagine what if and what can happen. And so, you know, the, the reality and what is, you know, time is all relative for the subconscious. And that's where the subconscious can really be such a powerful force to healing. And I think it's something we all have to catch up with. Sure. Oh, man. Um, the subconscious, like, what is it? Is it, you know, how much of who we really are is this conscious uh, in this moment right now, right? This conscious being who I identify as Trey, as opposed to my subconscious, who I'm not not even aware of. Like, how much, what, what, what is the makeup difference, right? Like, is it the subconscious, unconscious, like really 99% of who I am and the conscious mind is only 1%? Like, what does that look like? You know, I don't know. To be honest, I just know that the subconscious takes about 80% of the responsibility on a day-to-day -day basis. So most of what we do is unconscious or subconscious. And what that means is basically that, you know, we are navigating through life, being totally occupied in our heads, thinking about work or what just happened or the next, I don't know, football game. And we are not really there, but someone is doing the driving, washing the hair, even putting food in our mouths without hurting ourselves. So that's all what the subconscious is doing, plus all our emotions, all our values and beliefs are anchored in the subconscious. So if you hate your job, that is not something you consciously choose. That's your subconscious having some kind of an association with your job or with the colleagues or your boss. And that association makes you hate something. And we all know when we don't like something, it can make you miserable. So that is the power of the subconscious. Now, the subconscious doesn't want to make you miserable, but the subconscious just does what it does since ever until we tell it differently. It's like a very, very faithful servant that says, you know, my job primarily is to keep you safe. Secondarily, I want to make you happy. But if you have been not safe for a while, especially when you were little, the subconscious says, well, happiness, schmappiness doesn't really matter. We want to focus on safety. And that safety is really where a lot of people live in. No, this is, I think so many people that I talk to have an undercurrent of feeling uncomfortable, feeling, you know, anxious, feeling not safe. And that's how they go through their lives. And, and that's not really thriving. That's just surviving. And the subconscious is responsible for the surviving. But we have to tell the subconscious how to switch into thriving. That's our conscious job. No one in school or parents or whatever tells us how to do this. That's what we have to learn. Only Dr. Friedman does, right? And his book, The Empowerment <laughs> Solution. About a million others, but... <laughs> so uh, how, do we, how do we get around the subconscious, right? Can we, is it through repetition, like repeatedly doing like affirmations? Is it repeatedly doing a, a physical action or is it, do we have to go to hypnotherapy, right? Like, what does that look like? All of the above, but the most important thing for the subconscious is that we do have the subconscious on our side. See, I mean, how many times do we do things that the subconscious says no to, you know, where it just feels like it's a crazy idea? Let's say you, you got hurt in the past because, I don't know, maybe you were drinking and then or took drugs and then boom. You, you know, got a DUI or, you know, you had an accident or something. But next week, you're going to go out again, do the same thing again. Well, the subconscious looks at you and say, well, you're just, you know, not really a trustworthy person. So I guess I have to watch out for you and I need to prevent you from getting hurt again. And, and then the subconscious says, OK, you know, you still want to get out. I'm going to create more anxiety. Maybe I'm going to create, you know, social anxiety or maybe I'm going to 
you know, make you feel ill so that you don't want to leave the house. There are all these methods that the subconscious does. And the less it trusts us, the more it just takes over. So we have to build trust. And that means we have to first understand what is actually the core concern of the subconscious. You know, what are the limiting belief that the subconscious thinks this is what the world looks like and this is your little self in that world. I'm not fitting in. I'm not good enough. Only if I'm pleasing others, I can get acceptance. These are the core beliefs. We have to understand those. That's the matrix that the subconscious is attached to. And we have to change that matrix. And then we have to implement those changes. So we have to go from, you know, I'm not safe to proving ourselves well, maybe I cannot control everyone around me, but I can act safely. I can take care of myself. I can make good choices. That's your repetition. That's where you have affirmations as this is what I want to believe. That's the direction I want to go. But it needs to be systematic. It's like, you know, you're you're basically telling the subconscious from being your nanny or your bodyguard to, hey, let's just be a playmate. Let's help me. That's a big shift. And that doesn't happen overnight. Sure. I've, I've noticed like my body, um, recently as today, like going through a shift where, um, like my, I can feel my programs coming up, right? Like, um, for safety or going along with social expectation, right? Um, just in a decision, right? Like to, uh, like focus more so on the show and the podcast and utilize school more so as a tool to like fuel my curiosity and spirituality and consciousness, as opposed to a a career change for myself. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is pulling up triggers of safety. I can hear old um, voices in my head coming up as, are you crazy, man? Like, what are you doing? Like, and I can feel my body. Like, I just feel like it almost feels like, um, maybe it's cellular wisdom coming up. I don't know. Maybe it's a change. Maybe it's like, I feel my heart's desire is pulled more toward being more vocal, stepping more into my light, Mm -hmm. voicing, voicing innate wisdom that we all have within like awakening more so to that and, and experiencing conversations like this about the subconscious and our true nature but there's a fear associated with that. So I can feel it in my body. Like, how do you coach a client through that? Cause I'm looking through some of your, um, common rationalizations and I'm like, check, check, check. Like, <laughs> all of that is going on in my body right now. Like, how do you coach somebody through that? Well, I mean, safety is a big one, right? Because it's basically for most of us also tribe, you know, being a part of the tribe and doing what um, hasn't been done before or doing something different than the expectations. Oh my God, we're going to be kicked out of the tribe. That's a very, very deep fear that we have. So there are different things that I would suggest. One is, first of all, don't necessarily go too far out in already thinking what you're going to do in the future. Because the important thing is that the subconscious knows that, all right, we're going to take it step by step. It's like building a house. Let's not just, you know, get ahead of yourself. So safety is also based on the choices. You know, when I started my work, I did it just part time because I knew my subconscious was going to freak out if I just going to stop being in the university. And so I just had one client, two clients, and then just, uh, you know, started from there. And that was a very smooth way for the subconscious to ease in. The second thing is, what do you want to really have as your core value? So when I did my coaching, as I started uh, to change my career, this this person I was coaching with, she helped me realize that my core value, the most important thing in my life is freedom. And I did not know that. I was like, whoa, freedom. And if you think about, okay, safety is often not free. Safety, the price you pay is actually that you're somehow making all these concessions and let yourself be locked in. And And that made it so much easier for me to say, well, if freedom is my highest value, okay, make safety maybe number five on the list and not number one. And the third thing is then, you know, what do you have as evidence that you can take care of yourself? People don't necessarily believe so much in evidence. And I think it's so important that you have a list of things that tell you, of course, I can do this. Here's the reason why. And I had to go through this list myself. And 
And that is where the inner critic then said, okay, you have actually really thought this through. I can see that you really have something going on. I can see that even if something is difficult, you already have a plan. And that's very soothing. Now, the thing is you have to feel what you're saying to the subconscious. The language is feeling and visualizing and sensations. You cannot just come up with words. That's why affirmations often don't work because we only have the words in our head. It's like, you know, speaking, I don't know, Swedish or Icelandic and, you know, no one understands it unless you live there. And so it's really a good idea to just get the feeling of what does freedom mean or what does it feel to be on purpose? What does it feel to do what really is your soul's desire? And if you feel it, your subconscious understands it. Is that the language of the subconscious is feelings? Feelings, visualizations, uh, internal uh, sensations, you know, where you actually can imagine yourself, how great it feels when you are doing dot, dot, dot. So these are the three big mm -hmm. ones that the subconscious loves. Freedom, right? Like that's totally mine, right? And everything <laughs> that freedom represents, even financial freedom and not being ashamed to say that, right? Like not to be triggered by an old, an old belief or, or program stating that money is bad, right? Like that's, that's just an old program of mine of where I grew up and middle class and looking upon money as bad because people with money ha do bad things and have bad intentions, like shedding that belief, right? Financial freedom is important to me. And I look at money more so now as energy, like in an exchange of energy, right? Like the energy that I put into this show and then I receive a, a money, which is just energy essentially for it, right? Right. But financial freedom, freedom in general, are you free? Do you consider yourself free right now? You know, that's funny because just this morning I was riding with a friend, you know, we have these horses and we are once a week going out in the woods. And I asked my friend, so what was the happiest time you ever were having in your life? And so she told me hers and, and I said, you know, I think I'm actually really happy in this period of my life now because I'm the most free I've ever been. Yeah. So I wouldn't say I'm totally free, but I think I'm getting closer mm -hmm. and, uh, I don't think it's the same thing with, you know, self uh, discovery It's never going to end. And I think, you know, living on purpose doesn't always, you know, have a finish line. You just continue to find it. And I think I'm going to continue to find freedom and, and whatever that means for me. And that's kind of something that also needs to be redefined. So if you, let's say a lot of people I work with are financially free, but they feel totally unfree in other ways. So you have to really you know, make freedom something where you're seeing, okay, where are you still locked down, where you're still imprisoned, and where do you imprison yourself? I mean, there are so many ways we imprison ourselves. Even spirituality can be an imprisonment. And that's something we just have to be aware of. Whatever makes us not really feel we can be truly ourselves, because somehow we give our power to a dogma, or we give our power to an idea, and and we're not really feeling aligned, but we're feeling like scared to not do what we are supposed to do. That's not freedom. Mm -hmm. How do we take our power back though? When we get caught up in that, right? Like, um, whether it's spirituality, when you give, like give an example of giving our, our power away to spirituality, that's very interesting. Well, I think, you know, where there are people that are talking a lot about, you know, this, um, being on a spiritual path. And uh, being on a spiritual path for them also means that there is really no room for feeling bad or complaining or having negativity. The problem is they do have all of this, but they don't allow themselves to express it. So there is this, you know, language of, oh, I'm really great. And yes, it's everything has a reason and everything is meant to be. But deep inside, they are not speaking their truth because the, the human side of them, the side that does feel disappointed, that does feel scared, that does feel all those lower vibrational emotions is not expressed, is not shared. Because in their mind, this is not how they are supposed to be. This is not what a spiritual person stands for. This is not what they have been working on. So this is where, you know, the spiritual escapism can also make you disconnected from yourself. And I think it's totally okay to be spiritual and scared. It's totally okay to doubt everything and still believe in the one, you know, greater power. It all can be simultaneously. 
I mean, we're living in a plurality or duality, and so it's okay to have it all. I think when we're denying ourselves something that is really important at one's attention, that's when we are in prison ourselves. Yeah, we're denying ourselves that subjective experience, right? Like exactly, we are. Like I get caught up in it too, right? Where I I highly resonate with someone's story, and I'm like, oh yeah, man, this is the truth, right? But I feel like there's a a billion truths, right? It's everyone's individual <laughs> truth, right? Like your truth is different than mine. Your experience is not mine. So, and hence it's not my truth, right? Like my truth is my experience. So whatever I, whatever I experience in meditations, prayer, fasting, exercise, work, all of that, right? I bring back within me, right? And get to know the self and like really feel all the emotions that are tied to those experiences, right? And then and then kind of not not like, you know, to your point, I think integrate all of that together. I don't think label anything as good as bad, but like really feel your body and feel like what you resonate with in that experience. And then like decide for yourself what it is that you want to align with, right? Like be your own ideal person. Don't be the ideal person that society says you have to be or spirituality or, or uh, religious dogma, right? Like be the person, be the individual that Dr. Friedman wants to be, right? Like it's great that you put these books out, right? It kind of helps you, it points you back to yourself and uh, which I think ultimately leads us to our higher self, our superior selves, right? Um, but there's a lot of work that goes into that because, you know, through meditation, right? Like I find myself getting frustrated at times because I don't know if I'm doing it right. Like you know, I'll listen to like, um, Yogananda stuff. And I'm like, why in the world can this guy materialize in another room somewhere in, in a different universe? And I can't even pay attention to like, you know, my breath for five seconds. Right. Like I think it takes a lot of work, right? Like I'm, I'm putting together this idea, this concept of like the warrior monk, right? Like I identify very much so with that term, that term where I create a container, right? Like a, a masculine container for the feminine energy, right? Like I go out and I exercise and I, and I, I have this, you know, alpha personality where I, you know, I attract things like that in my life, right? Like ice, ice baths, um, five mile runs every morning, things like of that nature. Right. But I also identify with the monk aspect of life, like going within going and doing my meditations, like really finding that light within and that consciousness and and not identifying, but more so resonating with that and exploring that and allowing the wisdom to come through me that is in a larger consciousness system. So I don't even know where I was going with that, but it just seems like um, we get away from really truly looking in because one, we're scared, right? We're scared of what if my experience isn't the same as as yours, Right. And am I doing it wrong? Am I am I not good enough? So conditions of worth come into play too, because um, we are taught at a young age, programmed at a young age, that this is what success looks like. All the books that we read, the people we 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 see their success and whatever modality they're performing, and then when we don't achieve that, we kind of look down on ourselves. Does any of that make sense to you? Well, absolutely, and I think you speak exactly what a lot of people are feeling, but I think it's even worse because you have done a lot of work, but you know, I would say the majority of people feel lost and the majority of people just don't really know anymore where to go, what to believe, you know, this is this constant bombardment with all this information. I mean, you and I are just voices out there mixed with millions of other voices out there. And because it's available constantly and simultaneously, it's absolutely confusing. It's All very confusing. Who do All I believe in? Yeah. yeah. And so that's where I just feel like our life has been so much more complicated now than it was 50 years ago. And, and that's where we have to stop, stop looking outside, stop trying to, you know, get the right way and the right answer and the silver bullet and all this stuff and go inside. You know, meditation is a beautiful tool, but it's also really hard. And I think sometimes meditation is a little bit like, you know, staring in the abyss and hoping something comes out. And I think there are better ways in some ways to get closer to yourself when you're actively working with the subconscious, because the subconscious is the intercessor between your higher self and your conscious self. So if you really want to go to your higher self, 
you can certainly work with your subconscious to get there. And so having more inner dialogues, having more compassion for this, you know, anxiety of yours, having more a visit of all the aspects of yours, the inner child, the inner critic, the ego, whatever you want to call those different parts, connect. That's what drives me nuts about meditation sometimes. I know it's hard, it's hard, but that it's so passive. It's like the sitting and waiting. And that's, you know, a wonderful path and has been, you know, proven for thousands of years. But we don't necessarily have that time. And I think we want to also go more and really reach within, not just sitting and hoping something comes to us, but looking for ourselves. There's one part in the book that is about looking for your innocent self. And that's such an important piece, you know, where at some point we all lose our innocence. And what I mean with that is not that, you know, something bad happens and all of a sudden we are jaded. It's more like that we are losing the innocence of our true self, who we are really meant to be. You know, like I was a happy-go-lucky child. I know others were like really courageous and adventurous and had no worries in the world and all these things that we have as children and boom, taken away from us. And I think that's the thing that we have to remember and rewind. Who was I before I was losing my innocence, before I was told, well, who you are authentically is not enough. That's not what we want. That's not acceptable. Too loud, too sensitive, too this, too that. And then we just lock it away. It's not gone. We just lock this piece of us away. And we can look for it, we can find it, we can unearth it and then integrate it in our life. And that in itself will fill a void inside. Mm. Beautiful. I love that. Um, so interestingly enough, right? Like, so I see, uh, and I hope it's cool I bring this up, right? I think it's important to, you know, kind of go over a little bit. Um, so I watched an interview with you and your wife, right? And then I kind of did some <laughs> research on your wife. And you guys, um, I have to say on air, right, for the record, like at some point, you and your wife and I have to have a conversation, right? Because like, I feel like her work is important to you. It is. Absolutely. Yes. Um, definitely. You should definitely talk to her. She has also a book coming out or a card deck coming out in May. So she would definitely love to talk to you. Um, yeah, I saw something on her website, something about Thoth. Is that how you say it? Right? Mm -hmm. Like, what is, who is that? Well, that's an Egyptian deity. It's a deity of wisdom, medicine, writing, and that's how, what she channels mostly. That's one of that those sources that she mostly brings in and and works through since oh, many many years now. Sure. So, as a as an ex M, well, I guess you're not an ex MD, but someone from that uh, more conventional side of the house, like see how far you've come, right? Like through looking through a screen of objectivity, right? Like a scientist would, right? And now we're working in the world of subconscious where everything is relative and everything is subjective. Like, how do you get people to, re like people that have this concrete mindset, right? To think more ab abstractly, right? Like how do you raise awareness and consciousness in masses, right? Like, is it just showing up and talking about these subjects or is it kind of like it will happen when it happens? Uh, I think it's important for people just to know the whys, you know, why do you want to do it? What does it cost you to just let go of this disbelief and all this, you know, I only believe it when I see it, three dimensional thinking and actually delve more into the magic of life. What can you gain from being more open minded and just rather than thinking this is right or wrong feeling, does it resonate with you? Is it in alignment with you? And, you know, I have to say, when I did my first Kundalini experience, really like a Kundalini rising experience, it was a big waking up. But I was, you know, definitely not right away saying, oh, wow, yes, that must be a spiritual experience. I mean, I must have what, been hungry or I what was that like? What was that water. Like? Yeah, yeah. What was that experience like? <laughs> well, you know, it was like my first class I took, and there is this one Kriya, it's called Sat Kriya. And uh, basically, you just pump your navel and you say Satnam and you have your arms stretched out and you close your eyes and it's really intense and all this energy goes up there. And all of a sudden, there was like this whoosh of energy from my sacrum going up my spine and 
And then, you know, you lay down and you just watch your body. And my body was like vibrating. I mean, I felt things of my body that I've never felt before. And uh, yeah, it felt great. But naturally, I was looking for explanations. You know, what happened? It's probably hyperventilated. And, <laughs> and but then, you know, what was beautiful about it is that I just kept on coming back. And, and that nice feeling of aliveness and connectedness lasted longer than the class you know afterwards it was five minutes after the class that i still felt like this and then it was gone and then an hour after the class and you know it just got longer and longer and at some point i just felt it you know for you know days after the classes and that was really for me a sign that something is happening this is not just you know an immediate effect of an exercise there is some realignment some reconnection happening and and that was beautiful mm. do you still have those experiences now uh no i haven't really gone for it i mean it's like uh, i feel this i mean i wouldn't say that i'm always super connected to myself i'm not walking on water but uh, i don't think that <laughs> that you know that's like how you always go into these different uh I don't know, journeys of your life. And the Kundalini journey was definitely like a long and beautiful journey, but I'm not having it as my main go to to connect to myself anymore. There are other ways I'm connected to myself. And there is definitely meditation. I do a lot of, uh, yeah, connection through nature. I mean, I'm definitely when I'm in nature, and we are living in a beautiful nature, I mean, I feel the divine everywhere. And it's such a grounding feeling, you know, I had done because of the book release, so many interviews, and it's so interesting how you get pulled, you know, pulled into all this, you know, attention and pulled all into this, you know, buzzing. And then I go out and, you know, just give a carrot to one of my horses and boom, you just are right in the present moment. Say, oh, wow, that's reality here. All this other stuff, that's nice. But here, feet on the ground, carrot in the hand, you know, a sober of the of the horse on you <laughs> running down your fingers that's really what life is also you know enjoyable about and and that is very important for me just to feel this heartbeat of life every moment and not be so much in the head and not so much you know in the projecting mm. and thinking ahead. what is our true self right like you talk about connecting with you know that self right like what is your what is your truth about around that concept? I do believe there is a true self that has been with us for many lifetimes. Maybe we are not even always on Earth. I had experiences in Egypt where I really had all of a sudden such a terrible uh, homesickness. I mean, it was like, and we did, uh, you know, we lead these tours to Egypt together. And uh, we did a meditation on our origin, our star origin. And, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful, I mean, lots of the things you can either say literally, or this is metaphorically, but I just went somewhere in this meditation and it was some kind of a different place. And when I came back, I mean, I cried and in front of the whole group, I just couldn't stop sobbing. It was such a deep feeling. And so something really happened there. And, and so I think this essence of, mine and the essence of us just has many incarnations and many places that it went to but there is something that always is the same there's something that always stays the same and in one of the uh, you know processes it's realigning with your essence you actually go back you know you rewind everything all your personalities all the this is who i am all these false identities get shed away all the way to your birth in the womb and then you go back one step further before you got into actually the womb before you became matter i do this with bankers professors doctors all of them have an experience of whoa this is amazing i feel like there is you know something that i can connect to one guy who was a finance guy he told me I realize my essence is pure creativity and I haven't used any of this in my life. And then he just became an inventor. But there's just something about this, you know, this essence that just reminds you of something greater than your, yeah, than your personality, greater than what you think you are. And, and it's a very, very peaceful feeling. 
we cannot describe it. You know, sometimes we can say it's like a diamond with many facets and you are the diamond and sometimes you just shed light on these different facets. But it's also an inner sense of gravity. Since I had been reconnecting with my essence and I do that's one thing I do regularly, I do feel there is a deeper sense of inner gravity. I'm not getting so easily pulled either by emotions or by people or expectations and feels really, really good. And it also is very soothing because you know, yes, this life matters. This is this journey. This is where you sign up for to get the most out of it. But then you move on another adventure. Let's see what happens next. So there's no fear of death anymore since I felt and have really been aligned with this anymore, at least for now, not that <laughs> death is imminent. So it's easy to say, you know, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've I've worked with a couple of people and and recently um this person has said that uh my like or, not my origin maybe but like an older or you know I say older like it's linear but a past life um where I I was from a different um like galaxy or something like Sirius or something and I came back to this this 3D reality to kind of help out people and consciously right to, to help raise consciousness right that's been my pattern throughout this this uh in this incarnation and many other and others in the past and i'm thinking to myself if i'm so advanced right like as this conscious being and i come back to help out this society and these and people here like is that a regression because i feel like this is one hell of a veil if if, if so because i i don't remember any of that like i just i feel like you know, obviously, uh, people, I get, you know, frustrated in, in, in some of the meditation and some of the, you know, I look around and, and I don't get me wrong. Right. Like right now, I think it's more so like I'm feeling it in my body more so just because of, of my decisions lately of like really stepping into my power. And I feel like this is just kind of like transference of those emotions really. Right. Um, but that's just the old paradigm breaking down. Right. And, and going through this evolution of self. I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm losing a lot of, like, I keep seeing the number nine, nine, nine everywhere. And every time I look that up and Google it, it's like, um, kind of a closing of a chapter or, or, or a new birth of something. And I can, I can see how things are starting to fall away. Like relationships, I'm changing people around me are reacting a different way. Um, either it's con higher consciousness energy coming into my body and my cellular membrane is, is changing, but I can feel it. How do you coach somebody who's going through that change, right? Who's who's aligning more so with the true self, with higher consciousness that may be seeing and witnessing, um, you know, terminations in relationships, changes in, in people outside of oneself who starts doubting their path, right? But they know in their heart of hearts that they're doing the right thing. Keep on going. There is not a lot of coaching need to be done. I mean, of course. <laughs> so easy to say. <laughs> well, there is, of course, that, you know, the doubt based on beliefs and, you know, imprints from the past and uh, ideas of having to be a certain way. You know, the thing that I find is so interesting that you and I and many people think, you know, okay, like we are here to make a difference. As if all the other people didn't also come from maybe past lives or other places and also are here to make a difference. I mean, what if we are all higher, have a higher consciousness and we're just not aware of it at different degrees? You know, there's not like, oh, there is this a beginner. This is only like, you know, maybe one incarnation. Well, I guess this guy needs a lot of help. <laughs> what if we are all just playing our roles perfectly? You know, just that we are really going into this uh, loud planet. I think this is one of the most chaotic and loud. It's like, you know, living in a disco or something like this. There's so much, you know, distraction. And, and so if we are able to wake up in this planet, whew, we have reached a lot. I mean, there is just so much that we can get lost in and so much that we can have as, you know, choice points where we choose spark, light, you know, what's in it for me? What can I make as a contribution? Love, hate. I mean, there are all these choices we can make along the way and no one makes them for us. And if you stay on this track, I mean, somehow we must be up for that. You know, we chose this because it's not just because we are so altruistic. There's also something in it for us. 
And I think before we even think about raising people's awareness, we have to find our own raised awareness. We have to connect to ourselves. And I think that's really ultimately what we're here for. I mean, it's great to make contributions that what I want to do. And, but I also definitely know this is a very individual journey of growth and evolution. This is a remembering that I have signed up for. And at the end of my life, I want to know that I have remembered and that I have reconnected and that I made my contributions, but also that I can leave this plan and feel like, well done, good mm -hmm. job. I did it. <laughs> and that's what I'm looking for. And then when you are as a client say, you know, I have doubts, as long as you remember what it's for, then you say, okay, it doesn't really matter if I have now, you know, my 401k full or something like this, because it's going to happen or not. But the most important thing is when you have your last breath, that you feel satisfied, sure. that you feel like I have no regrets, because mm -hmm. you're going to move on. And then you're going to say, oh, shoot, I, I missed out. I have to go back. And that, I don't know if that's really what we want. I mean, I, I'm not so sure about that myself. <laughs> would you, would you, would you come back, right? If you're, if you were after you, you passed through this reality and, and you're in life in between lives or whatever, and you have a choice, right? I mean, can you honestly say you would come back? I mean, I don't know. I don't know either. I mean, the jury is out. No <laughs> idea. It's, <laughs> we'll see. I mean, if this is all burning down, probably not, but uh, sure. we'll, we'll, yeah, sure. we'll work on that. It doesn't. <laughs> well, I also like wonder too, is there like a socioeconomic status associated with awareness, right? A consciousness, right? Like if someone is struggling, who's making ends meet, right. And who is at the bottom of Maslow's hier hierarchy of needs, they can't, I don't know if they can think about or be aware of like raising their consciousness if they're worried about paying the bills, right? Like, how do you, what, what's your, what's your message to those folks? But that's exactly the survival patterns, you know, that I write in the book about. It's all about this, you know, how can you make another day happen? And while you do it, all your energy, all your power goes to your job or the welfare or whatever you are getting. And you're not feeling any power inside of yourself. And the longer you live in this illusion, the more you disconnect from yourself because you're not asking the questions. Who am I? What do I want? What is this all about? Those questions are free. And the answers cost you $5.99. I mean, you just have to really take time, even though you have maybe a busy job and even though it's a lot of struggle, there's always time for us to have to start the journey to bring our power back, to start the journey and listen inside. What do I really want from this life? What really holds me back? What are the beliefs I was told? And But there are many choices people make. You know, people struggle, and I totally understand that. But then they also can make the choice that I have struggled so much, let's have instant gratification. Let's just numb myself out with, I don't know, TV, food, anything that makes me feel better. And that's a choice. And certainly if you struggle and you don't feel like you have a lot to look forward to, that choice is much easier because it just feels like, okay, at least I can have a little bit of this pleasure. And it's harder than, you know, having six weeks of vacation and sitting somewhere in a lounge chair in Hawaii and feeling bored. And then you can say, oh, maybe I'm just going to pull this book. I, definitely there is a socioeconomic difference, but we all have the responsibility no matter where you are. And I think sometimes when people have little, they have also less to lose because there is something that people that have a lot that feel very attached to what they have and attached to what they need to take care of. And well, and I kind of let go of the status and the relevance. And, and that's harder often to shed away these illusions and really come to yourself. And if you say like, you know, I just felt always that there is something inside of me, but I never really had a chance to look for it. So I'm going to look for it and I have nothing to lose because I really don't have a lot. So it's a, uh, you can always see it from both ends. Yeah. Now you said illusion, right? My ears perk up now. Let me get your take on this, right? What's your philosophy on this being a, a virtual reality? Is it uh, the illusions or the, is it the roles that we play in society that is the illusion or is this physical reality? Is physical matter actually an illusion, the Maya? Uh, I don't believe that it's a virtual reality or that we are in some kind of a computer game. 
but I do believe the illusion is that we are making it up. You know, we are the creators of our experience. And so you and I are talking. And as you said, we have all very different experiences and we are literally not even physically there. So you may actually be some AI who is just, you know, talking there and and that's totally fine. I have a good connection with you. So whatever you are, I'm happy with this. But the thing is just we cannot really see anything without our interpretations, without our filters, without that what we are making out of it. And, you know, you can see it right now very clearly in the big divide politically. You know, there is one side that is very sure this is how it is and the other side say no that's definitely not how it is and and who is right and both live in their own belief system in their own value system in their own ideas and and that is something where you can just say yes you do make up your own reality you are living in an illusion now what is real is really only what you can say is your truth and that's why it's so important to find your truth you know, a lot of people say, oh, I just want to be authentic or I just want to be truthful, but they haven't spent one minute and even wondering what that means. They are just going into belief systems. And then that's the truth because it fits into what someone told me I need to believe. And that's why it's true. No, feel it, connect to it, have an intuitive response to it. That inner wisdom, that cellular wisdom, that intuitive wisdom, that higher wisdom, it's available. It's going to tell you exactly what's right for you, you will sense it. Maybe you even going to hear it, but you have to spend some time with it. Well, how do you discern that? Right? Like the, uh, the body wisdom, the, the body part, right? Like the, is it the heart? Because I know that my body right now, currently with the, with some of the decisions that I'm making, right. To go towards my desires, there is a pushback from that. Right? Like, so do you go off the heart when it comes to listening to your, uh, your body wisdom? Well, I think there are different factors. So there is the anxiety, there is, you know, that's definitely, you know, a reaction that can come from the body. There is resistance that can come from the body that just doesn't want to have change. But then when you really tune into the, you know, let's say intuition or this inner guidance, it's very neutral. There is not a lot of emotion about it. There's just like, that's the right thing. You just know it. And it's, for me, at least, you know, I can only speak for myself. It comes very fast. It's like there and I know it and I know if I don't really follow through with it, I'm going to regret it. And so I just learned to, I mean, it's not fireworks. It's not like, oh, wow, this is now Eureka moment. No, it's, it's matter of fact, very calm, very clear, but also undeniable. So it's a not emotional guidance system. What's the, system? Our, What's uh -huh. the uh, success rate on that? <laughs> <laughs> when well, I listen to it, it's a hundred percent, but I'm yes. not listening to it always. <laughs> so no, that's definitely me also say, no, I know better than, you know, I don't. <laughs> Dr. Friedman, man, this has been such a pleasure and a joy, my friend. Um, I can't thank you enough for hanging out. This has been awesome. I, I can't thank you enough for joining the show. Um, how can people find you and how can they buy the book? Uh, they can find me through my website, drfriedman.com. I have a podcast, Empowerment Solutions, on YouTube. They can go to under my name, Dr. Friedman. Uh, there are all these social media outlets. And the book can be bought in you know, all the Amazon, Barnes & Nobles, but also through the website. Oh, man, I got to ask you this, right? So I, um, I'm going to steal this from my buddy, Alex Ferrari. He's the host of the Next Level Soul podcast. And I was just watching him today and he usually asks all his guests at the end, like one simple question. And you know what? I feel like you're a good candidate for this question. So <laughs> um, what is your idea of God? My idea of God? Your idea of God. What is your idea of God? Well, I don't feel that there is, you know, a God that is a personality. I think a, a divine essence, I think, is something that I feel I I have inside of me, you have it inside of you, we are all connected to that. And for me, the idea of God is unconditional love and acceptance and peace. I mean, that is where I feel like when I go to God, when I feel, you know, whatever you want to call it, I feel that and I smell roses. 
every time it's a really funny thing. So every time I have this experience of, oh, wow, now I'm really connected. There is a smell of roses. <laughs> so that's a, definitely roses is a part of God. Yeah, but, uh, you know, I feel that we are all here as extensions of the divine. And if we're just saying like, well, you know, God, you are the one who needs to fix it for me. I think we are not taking responsibility. We're not taking care of what we're here to take care of. And mm -hmm. uh, well, I want to like, be... Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, is it more of a co-creation, right? Like, um, yes. like I, I do think that there is like, yeah, I believe that there is this, this aspect of me that is connected with the divine presence, divine consciousness. Right. But there's also like a co-creation factor in it where, you know, I have an intention and, you know, if I think that I'm by myself in this idea of individuality, like that can tear me apart. But if I, you know, if I, connect with this larger consciousness system and nurture that relationship i feel like my co-creation can can expand exponentially and i can i can step more into that power if that makes sense absolutely and i totally agree with that and i do feel that one thing that i do believe about let's say god is that it's all giving and it's us who is not receiving you know it's this uh, we just don't open up you know we don't say we feel lonely we are not like always opening up and say, oh, I want to just feel this love and this compassion for me, or I'm feeling like powerless, and there's all this power, abundance available to us, and the reminder of what's in, in us. We are not taking advantage of this. So we are really like, you know, there are all these, someone said to me, like, you know, you have 23 gifts out there waiting for you in front of the door, and you're just not opening the door. There's so much there, and somehow we don't believe we deserve it, or is it real, or we should get it ourselves. And so I think if we are want to experience God, we just have to be also willing just to receive more. And we have to know it's all there. It's a pantry that's always full. We just have to really go there and say, wouldn't it be nice? I would love that. I would love a little support. Yes, we are not like, you know, puppets on the string. We definitely have a responsibility and co-creation. But if you need help, and I have this experience always, if I needed something, and if I wanted something really badly, it always happened. Mm -hmm. I just had to not go into doubt. I didn't, I didn't go into forcing it. If it doesn't happen, you know, it's not real. It was more like, I know it's going to happen. It's just going to be open at this perfect timing. There is a flow. There is something that just, uh, that's how I manifested Danielle, my wife, for example. I mean, I was one year just thinking about her. I met her on a Kundalini yoga retreat and she lived in Tennessee. I lived in Seattle and, and we had one brief conversation. That was it. But I knew I want to see this person again. I always, every time I did a Kundalini class, I thought about her. I had no contact, nothing. I didn't even know. She said, thank God she would have thought I would be a stalker if I would have found out where she lives. And <laughs> so that was definitely good. But for one year, I put it out there. I'm going to see her again. There's, you know, there's her and uh, we're going to meet. And she was the first person I saw then the next time on this retreat and there are 1600 people. I mean, it's like a big retreat and it was the first person I ran into. And then yeah. would you say, like, what, was your, what was your thought when you saw her? You're like, I knew I would see you. I said, hi, Danielle. And she said, uh, I don't remember your name, but you were the guy who told me about the hot springs somewhere down in New Mexico. <laughs> so I was for her, the hot spring guy. And for me, she was a goddess who I wanted to see. Again. <laughs> Well, so at least I she clearly... associated you with the word hot, right? Like so the, hot, the word hot was in there. You're good to go, brother. <laughs> that is true. Absolutely. And we never made it to those hot springs. Too bad. But oh, well, <laughs> at least I mean, we you made it to still, each other. always go back, right? Like, yes. There's still time, brother. <laughs> Dr. Freeman, man, this is awesome, brother. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you. Yeah.